Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul Tatro. I'm the director of Ford's Theater. Welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you all tonight on behalf of Ford's Theater community. Uh, I offer a warm welcome to Mayor Sharon Pratt, Michael Steele, and historians Dr. Christopher Bonner and Dr. Michael Burlingame. At Ford's, we explore the legacy of Abraham Lincoln and celebrate the American experience through theater and education. We are happy to host the Institute for Politics, Policy, and Histories, Lincoln, a prov providential president as part of their Defining Fathers series. As organizations, we share a love of history, education, and an appreciation for the humanities. When the idea of this program was first brought to our attention, I knew that it had to take place at Ford's Theater. Today, Lincoln's consequential legacy continues to instruct, illuminate, and inspire people across the world. In many ways, this is why we have gathered this evening to investigate, to learn, to be inspired, and to be reminded of who President Lincoln was. I thank you all for being in attendance. One bit of housekeeping before we continue on. I'd like to remind everyone to please silence your phones. It'll make for a much more enjoyable evening for everyone. Um, and please help me welcome to the stage Shanna Bartley, the Policy Director at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Shanna. Thank you, Paul. We would not be here without your bold leadership as Director of Ford's Theater. We are grateful to be at this historic and sacred site where tonight we launched the Defining Fathers series. My name is Shauna Bartley. I'm a policy officer for the W.K. Kellogg Foundation. While the foundation is located in Mr. Kellogg's hometown of Battle Creek, Michigan, I am proud to call Washington, D.C. my home. I'm delighted to welcome you to the Institute for Politics, Policy, and History's presentation of Lincoln, a providential president. Tonight's dramatic reflections and panel discussion with eminent historians will take us on an eye-opening journey about the evolution of President Abraham Lincoln, his vision for a stronger union, eloquence, humility, and legacy of leadership have enabled him to become known as one of the most inspiring leaders in American history. Just as we were proud to support IPPH's Founding Fathers series last year, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation is proud to support the Defining Fathers series this year. The event kicks off the Defining Fathers series, a compelling mix of vodcasts and in-person live-streamed programs. It reveals the depth of the lives, motivations, and contradictions of President Abraham Lincoln, President Ulysses S. Grant, and freedom advocate Frederick Douglass. These leaders played a pivotal roles in transforming the nation's capital from a small country town into a metropolis. Their collective efforts to preserve the United States, abolish slavery, work towards equal citizenship for all, and reconstruct a bitterly divided but legally emancipated America led to the city and the country we have today. This series builds on the dialogue from last year that examined the lives of Presidents Washington, Madison, and Jefferson as they were pivotal to establishing the nation's capital in the South along the banks of the Potomac. Programming examined the economic and cultural conditions that enabled the sustained institution of slavery, despite the founders' establishment of America's Declaration of Independence, affirming all men are created equal. The W.K. Kellogg Foundation supports the Institute's work given the alignment between our missions. Embedded within all we do as a philanthropy is our commitment to advancing racial equity and racial healing, developing leaders, and engaging communities in solving society's most pressing and pervasive problems. We believe that to achieve more equitable communities, our nation must confront often difficult truths about the impact of systemic racism and racial bias throughout our history and within our present day experiences. This work is critical to developing the trusting relationships necessary to transform systems that hold us all back. Narratives about our shared past are powerful in shaping how we think about and understand our present. 
That is why we are pleased to support the Institute for Politics, Policy, and History in their efforts to illuminate history and create spirited dialogue around the issues that perennially challenge our nation. I'm excited to learn from tonight's program, and I hope you are too. Now it is a great honor to introduce Sharon Pratt, the Institute for Politics, Policy and History's founding director and the former mayor of our great city, Washington, D.C., as well as Michael Steele, IPPH's senior advisory co-chair, MSNBC co-host of The Weekend, and former Republican National Committee chair. Please help me welcome Mayor Pratt and Chairman Steele. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. Uh, I, my name is Sharon Pratt, and I am the, uh, some people, know, okay, some people knew. <laughs> uh, I'm the founding, founding, oh, that must be my family. Thank you. <laughs> I'm the founding director of the Institute of Politics, Policy, and History. We're going to call it IPPH, housed on the campus of the University of the District of Columbia. And all right. <laughs> and I'm going to tell you more about IPPH in just a moment. Uh, but first, I would like to acknowledge, first I want to thank Ford's Theater. Paul Traytalk, uh, we, you and your team are just magnificent. Thank you for yeah. your partnership. We are really a, a, a grateful to you. We're also grateful for, to W.K. Kellogg Foundation. Uh, and they've been a wonderful partner to IPPH. And maybe I should mention here, what is our mission? To rediscover the history of Washington, D.C. That is our mission. And as amazing as it is, we may have uh, uh, Fergus Borderwick with us tonight. He's, he is a great scholar. There's a little scholarship about the capital of the country and this great community a community with its own vibrant personality. And that is the purpose of IPPH. And so through our programs, we try to help as excavate that history. We did it last year with the Founding Fathers. We're doing it this year with the Defining Fathers, individuals, Americans, who had much to do with this becoming a major metrop metropolis. Now, I'm going to introduce my co-anchor in just a minute. He's too important for me to, to do it too soon. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge, I, it's difficult to know for, for certain who's all here, but I know that uh, Jack Evans was supposed to be with us tonight. Uh, and he's a former member of the council and on the Arts Commission. I know Gretchen Wharton's with us, and she's the vice chair of the Arts Commission. You know, Carol gave me this great list. Uh, Myers, uh, the, uh, who is here, is the executive director of the Arts Commission. Um, and uh, Chappelle, Reginald Chappelle, who's with the National Park Service, is with us. Um, and I also, good, <laughs> I got something right. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge our, our members of the advisory committee. Also first, UDC Board of Trustees, Dr. Carolyn Rudd and Warner Sessions, but also members of our IPPH Senior Advisory Committee. Uh, almost all of them are working. Uh, Mark Thompson, uh, Carol Fulp, uh, and then I'm going to introduce uh, this gentleman last. And another person that I wish to acknowledge tonight, she's an iconic personality. I almost hate to use that expression because people overuse it. But she is the owner of one of the most revered institutions in this city, and that's Virginia Ali with Ben's Chili Bowl. There she is. So tonight, we're very honored to be here at Ford's Theater because tonight we're going to talk about our 16th president who had a profound impact on this community, this great nation's capital. Uh, but the person who's best suited to talk about that 16th president and to get this show going is none other than the former chairman of the Republican National Committee, Abraham Lincoln, was the first president who was a Republican. Yeah. Um, 
he he's also, this gentleman, uh, the co-host of MSNBC's The Weekend. It's a great program. You've got to check it out, Saturdays yes, and Please Sundays. <laughs> and anybody with an earshot knows that the reason he became a Republican has everything to do with the profile and the positions and the policies and the personality of the man we speak of yeah. tonight, and that's Abraham Lincoln. We are so honored to have with us this evening Michael Steele. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you all very, very much. It is, it is always a special treat for me to, to do anything and to be a part of anything in my hometown where I grew up in Washington, D.C. Uh, Petworth in the house. There we go. Just wanted to get that out. Um, it is, it, it's a real special treat. It's a very special night. And um, just a quick uh, acknowledgement again to Ben's Chili Bowl. Thank you for getting me through so many years of crazy. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, these are very interesting times for all of us. And it is a reflective moment for me um, as a member of the Republican uh, Party. Um, and particularly when I consider uh, the party's history and its legacy, to be in this space especially, uh, and to know the sacrifice that one man gave for his country, and to look around at some in my party today who do not recognize that sacrifice. Um, and that's very difficult, uh, which is why conversations like this are very, very important. Um, IPPH is, has played, I think, an enormously important role in that, and I remember getting a phone call from the mayor, and she is like, I have an idea, and I want you to be a part of it. <laughs> okay, so you know how this conversation is going to go, right? It's like, okay, where do I show up? When do I need to be there? Um, and she, she shared with me this, this vision, her vision, um, of what the storytelling of this city should be about and to house it at such a fine institution as the University of the District of Columbia was another important part of that legacy. Um, and it's really kind of tying our, our presidents um, that we started our, our conversation with uh, last year uh, and now continuing this year to not just uh, Washington, but the institutions uh, inside of this great city and the people, most especially, all of you who, some of whom are native Washingtonians, a rare bird indeed. Um, uh, others who've come here thought they'd be here for two years and have been here for 40. Um, and you're now part of this important legacy and this important history. Um, central to that is something that Lincoln um, not only discovered about himself and had to rely on, but the country would come to lie on, and that is leadership. Uh, and that leadership was important to unify the nation, uh, to level up the conversation on equality uh, at a time when no one wanted to have that conversation, uh, to be an example of integrity uh, in the face of enormous opposition, and threats, uh, and to exhibit something that I wish more of our uh, officials, and certainly in my party, uh, would exhibit, and that's moral courage. Moral courage. Um, it all together inspired this man, uh, who uh, story is a fascinating story of happenstance and opportunity. Uh, to speak out against the dis divisive uh, rhetoric um, then uh, and today. It gives us that voice to look within ourselves and discover our own moral courage, our own sense of integrity, our own purpose for equality, and our own leadership. That leadership doesn't rest just in the people we elect but it rests in all of us as citizens because we've been endowed by our creator with inalienable rights for sure, but we've been empowered by our constitution to be the government that will guide this great experiment uh, along the way. And I think Lincoln grew to understand that in a very particular way. Uh, so when you think, step back and examine the moment, you realize that this man's legacy 
President Lincoln's uh, legacy has been written about more than any other president in history. And so tonight, we're going to focus on three aspects of his life that have defined not only his presidency, but our country as a nation. And certainly, as a young kid growing up in this city, I was inspired uh, by his story and his connection to my community in a very unique way. And understanding and appreciating how difficult it was for him to embrace, ultimately, uh, the freedom of the black man and the black woman. It's one of the big reasons why I don't refer to myself just as a Republican. I am a Lincoln Republican. And I try to remind people today what that once stood for, because it's important today. So as we go through this evening, we're going to look at Lincoln's unrelenting determination to preserve the Union how Lincoln defined the war in moral terms, and Lincoln's own evolution on enabling black citizenship. So we're going to begin with the preservation of the Union. President Lincoln was determined to preserve the Union. He was intolerant of those who disrespected the Union. And most importantly, he was intolerant of those who undermined the very principles that girded this country. For an immersion to Lincoln's words, we will experience dramatic reflections this evening from a very accomplished actor, Daniel Hubble. So let us begin. Sections of Lincoln's first inaugural address, March 4th, 1861. I hold that in contemplation of universal law and of the Constitution, the union of these states is perpetual. Descending from these general principles, we find the proposition that, in legal contemplation, the union is perpetual, confirmed by the history of the union itself. It follows from these views that no state, upon its own mere motion, can lawfully get out of the union that resolves and ordinances to that effect are legally void and that acts of violence within any state or states against the authority of the United States are insurrectionary or revolutionary according to circumstances. Section of a message to special session, July 4th, 1861. The assault upon and reduction of Fort Sumter was in no sense a matter of self-defense on the part of the assailants. And this issue embraces more than the fate of these United States. It presents to the whole family of man the question whether a constitutional republic or a democracy, a government of the people can or cannot maintain its own domestic foes. It presents the question whether discontented individuals, too few in numbers to control administration according to organic law, in any case can always, upon pretenses made in this case or any other pretenses, break up their government and thus practically put an end to free government on the earth. It forces us to ask, is there in all republics this inherent and fatal weakness? Must a government of necessity be too strong for the liberties of its own people or too weak to maintain its own existence? So viewing this issue, no choice was left but to call out the war power of the government and so to resist force employed for its destruction by force in its present preservation. The power of those words speaks to Lincoln's unswerving commitment in honoring the very principles upon which our nation was founded. He meant it. He felt it. 
And he began to understand exactly what that's, this moment meant for not just him as president, but for the country. Mayor, I think in many respects uh, that the Civil War was not just about the end of slavery. Uh, we know it clearly didn't begin with that as the focal point. Right. That was not what, what it was all about. But Lincoln incrementally began to decide and to move his administration uh, and his actions um, in a way that reflected that this great war needed to have a moral purpose to it, that there was something more about this that he felt we needed to focus on as a nation. Um, and that ultimately led to the central purpose becoming ending slavery. Right. No, uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, we put this program together not because of where we are today, but because of Lincoln's profound impact on this suddenly becoming, instead of a backwater venue, a real metropolis because you had to have a federal presence to prosecute a civil war. And I think it's what you've just observed, Michael, is so powerful. You know, you don't get to change the rules just because you don't like the outcome of an election. And that's the point that Lincoln made. And he, he was determined to marshal the resources of the federal government so that they would honor the understanding, the compact that they made when they became a part of the United States of America. You don't change the rules in the middle of the game. So, but you're right. After a point, it sort of had a regional overtone to it. Uh, the North thinking industrial, the South thinking a planter uh, system where that very much relied upon the enslaved people. Without a doubt, what the element that was percolating beneath all of this was the issue of slavery. And so Lincoln said, this war has got to be, have a moral mission. It can't just be about a different philosophy on the economy. Right. And that's when he started moving in the direction of emancipation. Section of Abraham Lincoln, Letter to Horace Greeley, Editor, New York Tribune, August 23rd, 1862. My paramount object on the struggle to save the Union, and my paramount object on the struggle is to save the Union, and is not either to save or to destroy slavery. If I could save the Union without freeing any slave, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing all the slaves, I would do it. And if I could save it by freeing some and leave others alone, I would also do that. Emancipation Proclamation, January 1st, 1863. By the President of the United States of America, that, on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them to, in any efforts they make for their actual freedom. That the executive will, on the first day of the January aforesaid, by proclamation, designate the states and parts of states, if any, in which the people thereof, respectively, shall then be in rebellion against the United States, and the fact that any state or the people thereof shall on that day be in good faith represented in the Congress of the United States by members chosen thereto at elections, wherein a majority of the qualified voters of such state shall have participated, shall, in the absence of strong countervailing testimony, be deemed conclusive evidence that such state and the people thereof are not then in rebellion against the United States. Now, therefore I, Abraham Lincoln,
President of the United States by virtue of the power vested in me as Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States in time of actual armed rebellion against the authority and government of the United States and as a fit and necessary war measure for suppressing said rebellion do on this first day of January in the year of our Lord 1863 and in accordance with my purpose so to do publicly proclaimed for the full period of 100 days from the day first above mentioned order and designate as the states and parts of states wherein the people thereof respectively are this day in rebellion against the United States the following to wit Arkansas Texas Louisiana except the parishes of St. Bernard Black Mines, Jefferson, St. John, St. Charles, St. James Ascension, Assumption, Terrebonne, La Forche, St. Mary, St. Martin, and Orleans, including the city of New Orleans, Mississippi, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Virginia except the 48 counties designated as West Virginia and also the counties of Berkeley, Accomack, Northampton, Elizabeth City, York, Princess Anne, and Norfolk, including the cities of Norfolk and Portsmouth, and which accepted parts are for the present left precisely as if this proclamation were not issued. And by the virtue of the power and for the purpose aforesaid, I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within shall desig said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free, and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. And I hereby enjoin upon the people so declared to be free to abstain from all violence, unless in necessary self-defense, and I recommend to them that, in all cases when allowed, they labor faithfully for reasonable wages. And I further declare and make known that such persons of suitable condition will be received into the armed service of the United States to garrison forts, positions, stations, and other places, and to man vessels of all sorts in said service. And upon this act, sincerely believed to be an act of justice, warranted by the Constitution, upon military necessity, I invoke the considerate judgment of mankind and the gracious favor of Almighty God. In witness whereof, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the United States to be affixed done at the city of Washington this first day of January in the year of our Lord 1863 and of the independence of the United States the 87th. Sections of letter to Albert G. Hodges, editor, Commonwealth Newspaper, Kentucky, on April 4th, 1864. I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember when I did not so think and feel. And yet, I have never understood that the presidency conferred upon me an unrestricted right to act officially upon this judgment and feeling. I have not controlled events, but confess plainly that events controlled me. You think about, and just in a moment, just think about August of 1862 and January of 1863. What happened? What, what did Lincoln see? What did he come to know that moved him from a position 
where he confesses, well, if we keep the slave, if we save the union by keeping slavery, I'll do it. If we save the union by eliminating slavery, I'll do it. To the point where he would then say, all black men and women enslaved in this union are now free. That's the moral compass that was locked in on that North Star of freedom. More than likely unrecognizable by Lincoln himself at the time, as expressed in, in the letter to Albert Hodges, where he says, I have not controlled events, but confess plainly that events controlled me. A man in leadership at a moment in a nation's crisis, leaning into the events around him and fixing his moral compass. Whereupon he says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. These words reflect Lincoln's moral compass. So Mayor, what, what do you think were the pra pragmatic consequences of the emancipation? And, and how much of Lincoln we see reflected in that given how probably conflicted he was, even at the moment he's writing this freedom for black men and women? Well, that was one time being from D.C. helped. He, we, <laughs> we were a federal territory, so he had the right to do something about it. Uh, and so D.C. was the first venue uh, to benefit from emancipation. You know, there's been a lot of back and forth about Abraham Lincoln in this city in the last few years with the liberation of Freedmen's statute, you mm -hmm. know. And does that reflect that he was the great emancipator and there was no agency on the part of people, uh, black people, African American people? Of course, we know that it wouldn't have happened without agency on the part of African Americans as well as others like Garrison and Thaddeus Stevens and others. But I'm with you, Michael. I think he had a moral center. There are people who are pragmatic, and he was mm -hmm. pragmatic. He says, the Constitution doesn't authorize me to do this, but now that I'm in a war, right. heck, if I'm going to let you benefit, those of you who are waging war against us, from the asset of enslaved people, I'm going to use that as my license and my excuse uh, to emancipate contraband, as uh, uh, General Butler said. Mm -hmm. uh, but he had a moral center. Those were tough decisions. And he understood the difficulty of it. it. Took him a minute to get there on black equality and citizenship, but he had a moral center. Even when he was in Congress, as you know, right. one term, he did try to enact legislation that would emancipate African Americans in this city, because he said, we certainly should have control in the District of Columbia. They have too much control, you know, I think that, but <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> he, and, and so you have to, uh, acknowledge that about Abraham Lincoln, I think. So let's conclude by looking at Lincoln's evolution on the full citizenship for black men and women. From one of Lincoln's debates with Stephen A. Douglas during the campaign for one of Illinois' two United States Senate seats, as reported in Chicago Daily Press on October 15, 1858. I am not now nor ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. That I am not, nor ever been in favor of making voters or jurors of Negroes, nor of qualifying them to hold office. I am, as much as any man, in favor of having the superior position assigned to the white race. Message to Congress on signing an act abolishing slavery in Washington, D.C. on April 16, 1862. Fellow citizens of the Senate and House of Representatives, the act entitled an act for the release of certain persons held to service or labor in the District of Columbia has this day been approved and signed. I have never 
doubted the constitutional authority of Congress to abolish slavery in this district, and I have ever desired to see the national capital freed from the institution in some satisfactory way. Hence, there has never been, in my mind, any question upon the subject except the one of expediency, arising in view of all the circumstances. If there be matters within and about this act which might have taken a course or shape more satisfactory to my judgment, I do not attempt to specify them. I am gratified that the two principles of compensation and colonization are both recognized and practically applied in the act. In the matter of compensation, it is provided that claims may be presented within 90 days from the passage of the act, but not thereafter. And there is no saving for minors, femmes covert, insane, or absent persons. I presume this is an omission by mere oversight. And I recommend that it be supplied by an amendatory or supplemental act. Second inaugural address, Washington, D.C., March 4th, 1865. Fellow countrymen, at this second appearing to take the oath of the presidential office, there is less occasion for an extended address than was first. Then a statement, somewhat in detail, of a course to be pursued seemed fitting and proper. Now at the expiration of four years, during which public declarations have been constantly called forth on every point and phase of the great contest, which still absorbs the attention and engrosses the energies of the nation, little that is new could be presented. The progress of our arms, upon which all else chiefly depends, is as well known to the public as to myself, and it is, I trust, reasonably satisfactory and encouraging to all. With high hope for the future, no prediction in regard to it is ventured. On the occasion corresponding to this four years ago, all thoughts were anxiously directed to an impending civil war. All dreaded it. All sought to avert it. While the inaugural address was being delivered from this place, devoted altogether to saving the Union without war, insurgent agents were in the city seeking to destroy it without war, seeking to dissolve the Union and divide effects by negotiation. Both parties deprecated war, but one of them would make war rather than let the nation survive, and the other would accept war rather than let it perish. And the war came. One-eighth of the whole population were colored slaves, not distributed genuinely over the Union, but localized in the southern part of it. These slaves constituted a peculiar and powerful interest. All know that this interest was, somehow, the cause of the war, to strengthen, perpetuate, and extend this interest was the object for which the insurgents would rend the Union, even by war, while the government claimed no right to do more than to restrict the territorial enlargement of it. Neither party expected the war the magnitude or the duration which it has already attained, neither anticipated that the cause of the conflict might cease with, or ever before, the conflict itself should cease. Each looked for an easier triumph and a result less fundamental and astounding. Both read the same Bible and pray to the same God and each invokes his aid against the other. It may seem strange that any men 
should dare to ask a just God's assistance in wringing their bread from the sweat of other men's faces. But let us judge not that we may be judged. The prayers of both could not be answered. That far, neither has been answered fully. The Almighty has his own purposes. Woe unto the world because of offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to that man by whom the offenses cometh. If we shall suppose that American slavery is one of those offenses which, in the providence of God, must needs come, but which, having continued through his appointed time, he now wills to remove, and that which he gives to both North and South this terrible war as the woe due to those by whom the offense came. Shall we discern therein any departure from the divine attributes which the believer in a living God always ascribed to him? Fondly do we hope, fervently do we pray that this mighty scourge of war may speedily pass away. Yet, if God will that it continues until all the wealth piled by the bondsmen's 250 years of unrequited toil shall be sunk, and until every drop of blood drawn with the lash shall be paid with the, with the sword, as was said 3,000 years ago, so still it must be said, the judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether with malice towards none, with charity for all, with firmness in the right as God gives us to see the right. Let us strive on to finish the work we are in, to bind up the nation's wounds, to care for him who shall have borne the battle and for his widow and his orphans, to do all which may achieve and cherish a just a just and lasting peace among ourselves and with all nations. Sections from Lincoln's last speech, April 11th, 1865. We meet this evening, not in sorrow, but in gladness of heart. The evacuation of Petersburg and Richmond and the surrender of the principal insurgent army give hope of a righteous and speedy peace whose joyous expression cannot be restrained. In the midst of this, however, he from whom all blessings flow must not be forgotten. A call for a national thanksgiving is being prepared and will be duly promulgated. Nor must those whose harder part gives us the cause for rejoicing be overlooked their honors must not be parceled out with others. I myself was near the front and had the high pleasure of transmitting much of the good news to you. But no part of the honor for plans or execution is mine. To General Grant, his skillful officers, and brave men all belongs. The gallant Navy stood ready, but was not in reach to take active part. As a general rule, I abstain from reading reports of attacks upon myself, wishing not to be provoked by that to which I cannot proper, properly offer an answer. In spite of this precaution, however, it comes to my knowledge that I am much censured for supposed agency in setting up and seeking to sustain the new state of Louisiana. In this, I have done just so much and no more than the public knows. We all agree that the seceded states, so-called, are out of their proper relation with the Union, and that the sole object of the government, civil and military, in regard to those states, is to again get them into their proper practical relation. The amount of constituency, so to speak, on which the new Louisiana government rests would be satisfactory to all if it contained 50, 30, or even 20,000, instead of only about 12,000, as it does. 
it is also unsatisfactory to some that the elective franchise is not given to the colored man. I would myself prefer that it were now conferred on the very intelligent and on those who serve our cause as soldiers. The Gettysburg Address. Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, November 19th, 1865. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who, gave their, who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we do so. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation, under God, shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel Hubble. He did a great job and, and gave us a sense of our 16th president, Abraham Lincoln. Thank you very much. And I hope that you observed in terms of the reflections, in terms of the public remarks of Abraham Lincoln, they were sequenced as they were because Gettysburg Address, he was probably the president more than even Thomas Jefferson that made the Declaration of Independence, the principles of it, front and center for the United States more than even the Constitution. But secondly, it was when he made those remarks after Appomattox on the 11th of April from the White House that he, that's when John Wilkes Booth and his co-conspirators said, no, we're not going to kidnap him. That's what they'd been thinking about. No, we're going to kill him. Because what did he say? That black men should have the right to vote. And that's when John Wilkes Booth said, that'll be his last speech. That's what he said, and it was.